In this talk, Alexander and me will show you in journals about Apple's new ultra-wideband technology. Apple built a new chip, officially called U1 and internally called Rose. The chip has been introduced with the iPhone 11 for spatial awareness. And since iOS 14, some functionality of the U1 chip is exposed through the nearby interaction framework. Even though it's been there for a while, nobody really knows what ultra-wideband is or does. Ultra-wideband is only available on the latest generation of devices. So on Apple devices, Checkmate supported iPhones do not have the U1 chip. However, the AirTags have a U1 chip and at $30 they are cheaper than some ultra-wideband development boards. Another barrier for hackers is that typical software defined radio setups do not allow to intercept ultra-wideband signals. So the bandwidth is way too wide and the frequency is too high for a typical SDR setup. So overall, I guess, ultra-wideband seems to be hacker-proof. Apple's platform security guide is usually very, very detailed. But when it comes to ultra-wideband security, there's almost no documentation. It only states that address and frame sequences are randomized, which is fundamental to privacy in wireless systems. However, this does not tell anything about security features of ultra-wideband on a chip or operating system level. Ultra wideband is so secure they even put it into vehicles. And one application is to use it as a second factor for keys. Signals are limited by speed of light, meaning that they travel a constant time and being sent over the air or through a cable. This means that an attacker cannot simply replay or relay a signal from a key to shorten the distance. Such an attack would introduce a measurable delay. Using this property as a second factor is also called distance bounding. In practice, the direct line of sight path might not be as strong because objects are in between. So in such a case, a non-line of sight path from a reflection like a wall or the ground can be stronger. However, you still want to use your key and open your vehicle. So Apple does not provide any non-line of sight accuracy for their ultra wideband chip. NXP advertises their chip with plus minus 10 centimeters non-line of sight accuracy. And when correlating paths, the signal strength of the shortest path might be lower than the indirect reflected non-line of sight path. The shortest path is earlier but weaker. And to compensate for this, there needs to be a back search window in that the ultra wideband chip looks for peaks. Any peak about the noise floor will be accepted as first path. An attacker can trick this algorithm by injecting short peaks that slightly distort a signal in a way that makes false shorter paths appear within the back search time window. And as of now, this attack has only been simulated because there is no affordable setup that would allow such an attack in practice. But considering that ultra wideband secure ranging is now being built into the newest generation of devices, this is still concerning. And with this, I'm handing over to Alexander, who is now going to show you a bit more about how ultra wideband is being used on iOS from a user perspective, but also from a framework perspective. Thank you, Jeska, for the introduction. I will now continue to present the ultra wideband features that are currently present in iOS and continue to dive a bit deeper into the internals of the implementation on iOS. The first feature that was made available using Ultra Wideband is an extension to AirDrop. This extension mainly changed the user interface in a way that the device at which the user is pointing is shown in a circle in the middle. This helps users to identify the person they want to send a file to and could be another hint against malicious actors trying to steal files. With iOS 14, Apple has opened up their Ultra Wideband interface to app developers. Developers are now able to use the nearby interaction framework to measure the distance and angle between two iPhones and to play games with this. Usage is quite limited because we cannot access more details than this and actually it requires a quite complicated setup on which we will detail later. Also, with the introduction of the AirTag, the Find My App gained support for ultra wideband. This is used to discover lost devices and it shows you the distance and the um, direction in which your device is placed. 
So this is a, an option to find devices in your place, but it's not feasible for longer distances as this is, has a maximum distance of around 10 meters. With iOS 15, Apple is, op is opening up ultra-wideband even more. Now ultra-wideband can be added to anything if the manufacturer is certified by Apple and now they can, you can integrate ultra-wideband hardware into your house, for example to unlock it or to have certain smart home features. You can unlock your car with ultra-wideband using the, digi the digital car key and also um, ultra-wideband can now be used for your, the key to your TARDIS. And now I will dive deeper into the airdrop and nearby interaction parts of ultra wideband. In this part, I will explain the two protocols in use, and then now, now we start with airdrop. So the first ultra, ultra wideband use case that we want to look at is airdrop. When users open airdrop, a lot of things start happening in the background. The devices will start sending out ultra wideband beacons and it will also start sharing Bluetooth Low Energy advertisements to inform user, users nearby about the just started airdrop. The first Bluetooth Low Energy advertisement is the main airdrop advertisement. This part is largely known by previous research and when an iPhone tries to send something over airdrop it will send these VLA advertisements. Those advertisements use a non-resolvable MAC address so it cannot be identified even by devices that are, have been paired to this iPhone. The first part here identifies this as an airdrop message. Then it just states the length of the whole advertisement and then we have a zero padding here. Then we get a version number and this is followed up by four truncated hashes from email addresses like the Apple ID and from phone numbers that are also linked to this Apple account. Now all devices in the surrounding know if their potential contacts is trying to send something over airdrop as they can compare the hashes here. They will start with the normal airdrop protocol in the background and now this ultra wideband part of airdrop is clearly separated from the normal airdrop protocol. So for the ultra wideband part it's also sending a different kind of second BLE advertisement. Um, this one uses actually a resolvable MAC address and it's of this nearby action type. This nearby action type is used for multiple features, for example the Wi-Fi password sharing and AirPlay. Then we have nearby action flags. And then we have a special type. In this case it's the action type called point to share. This is directly linked to ultra wideband and it's sent every time a device uh, has started airdrop. This informs nearby devices that this airdrop device is, has started ultra wideband beaconing and is awaiting responses by potential airdrop, other airdrop users. Also, all nearby action messages contain an authentication tag in the end. So, on the receiver side, the received BLE advertisements are parsed to the sharing key. Then the sharing key is able no, now able to identify that there is a nearby device and what this device wants to do. But also the sharing key needs to validate this authentication tag. This is possible because all previously connected devices share an identity resolving key. So all iOS devices are sharing these keys and they are stored locally on device. So for every received message they perform a zip hash algorithm using the MAC address and one of those identity resolving keys and then they check if the authentication tag ma matches. And if this, this is the case, this device has been seen before. So they know if this is actually a friend device. According to the Bluetooth specification, identity resolving keys or IRKs are used to resolve the actual Bluetooth address from the randomized address. Apple repurpose, repurposes them here to generate those authentication tags. Now the iPhone can be rather sure that the sending device is a friend's device. Therefore it starts forwarding this information to the nearby D through the wrapper D. Here iOS uses a trick to find friendly devices in ultra wideband. They use the same randomized MAC address for ultra wideband as for Bluetooth. 
So the nearby D initializes the U1 chip and whitelists the ultra wideband MAC addresses. Now the devi device can respond to the ultra wideband beacons initiated by the airdrop sending device. The sender gets information about the distance and the angle of nearby iPhones. This information is used to show the user the person they are pointing their device at. So this is how AirDrop's implementation of uh, ultra wideband ranging and angle of arrival works. Now we come to the second part, the nearby interaction framework. As shown with the nearby interaction framework, it is possible to range with nearby iPhones and measure the distance and angle to nearby devices. Furthermore, with iOS 15, Apple allows ranging with certified third-party ultra-wideband devices. To perform the ranging with nearby iPhones using the nearby interaction framework, both devices need to exchange NI discovery tokens. These tokens have to be exchanged using an out-of-band channel. This is left to the developers to implement it in a secure manner. The tokens are generated at random and the device which has the greater token will act as an initiator and the other device as a responder. And after the tokens have been exchanged, the user has to confirm the usage of ultra wideband. Similarly to AirDrop, both devices will start sending out ELEA advertisements. Those advertisements are different to the ones sent in AirDrop. So this, the advertisements are solely ultra wideband advertisements and they contain as, as the other ones before, lengths and flags, but also an authentication tag and an ultra wideband config. So only the initiator is sending the config and the responder device is only sending its authentication tag. But how are the devices now identifying each other? Both devices have a shared token. This token is used to find the other devices using BLE those BLE advertisements. Every token contains a 16 bytes randomly generated identity reserving key again. And similarly to AirDrop, this key is used to generate the authentication tag from the device's Bluetooth MAC address. They reuse the same Bluetooth MAC address for ultra wideband again. And this, is, this allows them to discover the correct device when perform ranging. After the devices have discovered their peer over Bluetooth Low Energy, um, they can now perform ranging over ultra wideband and continue. To secure this ranging, they use the so called scramble timestamp sequences. Scramble timestamp se sequences are used to generate multiple timestamps when receiving a message. Those timestamps then, can then be used to detect potential attacks on the protocol. And additionally, both devices can authenticate each other as they share the same STS values. So to get an extra distance at both sides, they should perform double-sided ranging. With this, the initiator sends the first message and then the responder replies to it. The responder replies uh, with the time when he replied and the initiator has the time when this reply has been received. And therefore, the initiator can calculate the time of flight by using the timestamp when the message has arrived and the time when the device replied. And also, they can deduct the processing times needed. The same procedure is handled on the other side, and both devices have distances and angle of arrival measurements in the end. So since the beginning of our research, we wanted to receive actual frames from iOS. Until now, the whole system is really closed down. We do not get any packet logs from iOS and we do only get high level reports of the measurements in the nearby daemon. So to receive ultra wideband signals, we first need to know what our hardware should be capable of. In the system logs on a jbroken device, we can unveil a few things. So for the nearby action, from the nearby interaction packet, we see the preambles that are used and the channels that are supported and that they are using a hop pattern mask here. And also we can see the usage of the scramble timestamp sequences. Many of those integers presented here are just an index in a list of a supported configurations. So when we check out the, those configurations, we see that ultra wideband here is using 64 megahertz pulse repetition frequency 
and as ultraviolet then uses pulses to transmit data, they, it can operate in different frequencies. And if they use uh, the SCS values, they need to use 64 megahertz according to the standard. So for 64 megahertz, we have four preamble codes and the indices is, are resulting to three, so which is here the preamble code number 12. The channels are also using indices, so it supports the one chip supports channel 5 and 9, and here we see that the start channel is channel 9 and channel 5 is the alternative channel. So next we need the right hardware. Now we need, uh, and we know that the development kits we wanted, uh, so we were looking for development kits that support the most recent standard. And we found the one from Quavo, which also uses the same channels as the one chip. Then um, Apple actually announced that they are supporting third party devices. And they are also saying that the Quavo device we actually bought is one of the third party development kits they are supporting. So we bought the right hardware here. But to receive frames, we also need to have the right configuration. So this is, needs a set of parameters and most of them need to match. Otherwise, the reception errors would occur and the frames would not be readable. Some parameters are clear from the logs, like the channel and preamble code. Others are not known and they are likely hard-coded in the chips, so they are basically the same for all transmissions. So those which are not known here are the SDS format and the SDF links. So why is this important? Let's take a look at the ultra-wideband frame format. Um, here we see we all frames start with a preamble. The preamble contains the specified preamble code and it can be repeated. So this is why the preamble can have a variable length. But um, with a wrong preamble code, we would never receive any frame. So the preamble would just not be detected. Then the preamble is fo followed by the start of frame delimiter or SFD. This um, start of frame delimiter Use, is used to uh, identify when the preamble ends. So that's why the preamble, it's not really important if we know how long it is. We just no, need to check for the SFD. Then the STS values start. And the STS also has, um, is used for this. Then the STS starts. The STS is used for the secure ranging and it can also have a value, variable length. So it, it's quite difficult to identify when the SCS ends and when the phi header would start because there's, it's not followed by something like an SFD. So we need to know what the actual length is, otherwise we would not receive any frames. Then to make this even more complicated, there is a second mode for the STS, so it can even be after the phi header. And also here it can have a variable length. And then there's a third mode where the STS is a, uh, after the SFD again, but no data is shared. So um, in this demo, I want to show you how we are, have started sniffing against an actual iOS device with a U1 chip. And we, for this, we start this um, demo app from Apple, which is using the nearby interaction framework. And then the two devices start discovering each other and the user needs to confirm that the ultra wideband is used and then they start ranging. We can see that they're ranging a distance here and we get a lot of locks on the left side from the iPhone and basically for every distance that is measured, we get this one uh, huge lock with the angle of arrival and the distance that's actually measured. On the right side, we have seen the frames that are received by Wireshark. So our, our frame uh, our sniffer has been attached to Wireshark and we were able to receive some frames here. But even though this looked very nice on the first side, we, from a closer look we see that it has still a couple of issues. So there are malformed packets everywhere received in Wireshark and even those packets that looked like they are not malformed have parts of, which, of those packets which are malformed or incorrect and also the data, which is part of the packets, looks very scrambled. So of course the scrambled data could be encrypted, but those issues are most likely caused by misaligned STS value. So we tried every combination of length and mode, but no one matched the Apple transmission modes. 
So Apple could have employed some custom SDS links, which is not supported by our um, device, or they could have additional data after the STS, which is not part of the official standardized frame format. So they could have used a custom frame format, for example. And I hope we will get more insights on this when the beta software from Corvo gets available so we can actually range um, with iPhones as supported with iOS 15 beta. So now we covered the two modes of interaction, AirDrop and nearby interaction. And AirDrop's ultra wideband communication has been the first that was on iOS. In AirDrop, one device sends ranging beacons and multiple devices can respond to it. Only the initiator or AirDrop sender is able to get the distance information. For nearby interaction, the ranging is performed in a peer-to-peer -peer manner. Every device ranges with another and both receive the distance information as they are performing double-sided ranging. The devices participating in AirDrop do not exchange any secrets and do not secure the actual ranging. While on nearby interaction, an initial off-band key exchange is necessary. Even though AirDrop ranging is not secured by an SDS value, it should not be particularly dangerous to use AirDrop. The ultra wideband part is just uh, just changes the order of how nearby people are shown in the user interface. And now I will hand over to Jeska again. Thank you. The nearby daemon is the one to start the distance and angle measurement, no matter if this has been initiated by AirDrop or the nearby interactions framework. For this, it's using the Rose controller lib, which then calls functions in IOKit to communicate with the U1 chip. And the chip initialization for the measurement is only done once. Then later on, in return, measurement tickets are sent multiple times containing the measurement data. The ticket data is not sent directly to other daemons. Instead, the nearby daemon combines data with the so-called Rolls neural engine sensor fusion and only forwards combined plausible measurements to other daemons. This still looks a bit like magic, and so in the following I will explain how iOS interacts with the underlying hardware. The U1 chip actually consists of two main chips. Both of them are ARM. The application processor implements most functionality and it's only 32-bit. And then the signal processor runs on 64-bit ARM with ASLI. It does this more time-critical tasks as well as the initial packet parsing. So for example, the application processor generates the next STS and forwards it to the digital signal processor, which needs it for the actual distance measurement and verification. The U1 chip has three receive antennas. This is required to get angular information and not only distance information. The three antennas are only required in the sensing, aka receiving direction. So Angles can still be displayed on an iPhone, which communicates with an AirTag U1 chip, even though the AirTag only has one receive antenna. All communication is routed through the always on processor. It keeps some basic state of the U1 chip and only wakes up the iOS kernel when needed. The iOS kernel in turn can set the ultra wideband communications route to either the application processor or the always on processor. While the U1 chip in the iPhone's HomePod Mini and Watch is very similar, the U1 chip in the AirTag is a bit different. It is the only U1 chip that is not powered by an iOS derivative and an always-on processor. Because of this, the AirTag U1 application processor has a few additional features. Moreover, since it does not have a display, it cannot show angular information and so has one receiver antenna only. More details about the AirTags and how to glitch the NRF chip that can then run custom firmware on them will be part of Thomas' talk, Hacking the Apple AirTags. All the chips I have shown previously run RTKit OS, which is a real-time operating system. Even if you have never heard of it, it runs on almost every embedded device by Apple. There are some exceptions, so for example, the NRF chip on the AirTags does not run RTKit OS. Our ticket OS is very lightweight and maybe around 100 functions or a bit more. It is so small that even logging is implemented differently in every our ticket OS firmware. Note that there are our ticket OS debug builds with additional features. So, 
For the U1 chip, there exists debug builds in the wild, and for example, the iOS 13.3 on the iPhone 11, as well as the initial AirTag firmware, both are U1 debug builds. You can find our ticket OS on almost every embedded Apple device, the AirPods 2 and Pro, the Pencil, the Siri Remote second generation, the Magic Keyboard variant for the iPads, the Always On processor, and more. A few more details about our ticket OS with a focus on AirPods and Apple's own Bluetooth chip are documented in Dennis' thesis. The iOS kernel has two drivers for the U1 chip, the Apple SPU Rose driver user client and the Apple SPU user client. These drivers can be accessed from user space via IOKit, and IOKit is a driver framework that takes care of exposing selected methods from the kernel to user space. IOKit also validates the parameters that are passed to these methods. The always on processor has equivalents to these two drivers, which are called rows and row supervisor. So when the kernel goes to sleep and the always on processor takes over, they are responsible. This principle is not unique to ultra wideband, so you can also find it for various other chips and features such as Siri. Even Apple's own Bluetooth chip, which is available in AudioOS for the HomePod Mini, is managed by the always-on processor. In the opposite direction, our ticket-based chips communicate with an RT body in the kernel. This is mainly used for logging. Note that the RT body is not directly exposed to IOKit. You can use the IORAC command to check the driver hierarchy. This is very interesting since it does not only show the IOKit user client, but also the corresponding interface name in the always on processor and the RT body dependency. This is very useful to see which chips on an Apple device actually run RTKit OS. The nearby daemon can directly send raw byte commands to the U1 chip. It still needs to use the IOKit framework. To do this, it calls the function IO connect call method, and by setting the proper mark port, it selects the Apple SPU ROS driver user client. The second argument is 5, which means that the function X ROS ticks is called in the kernel. Note that there are a lot, a lot, a lot of other functions in this driver. So, for example, the properties are being used during the ROS chip boot to get its unique identifier. When sending a raw command to the kernel, it still passes a few wrappers before eventually being forwarded to the always on processor. In this specific example, the always on processor does not handle anything but forwards the command to the U1 chip. The application processor in the U1 chip then finally parses the command. However, in some situations, the always on processor also needs to keep a state about what is happening in the U1 chip. In this case, another driver is called the Apple SPU user client. In this example, a property is set that affects the always on processor state as well as the U1 application processor state. The Apple SPU user client exports fewer methods and they are primarily meant to get and set such properties that also affect the always on processor. In this example, the MAC address of the U1 chip is set. Note that this is simply two zero bytes concatenated with the Bluetooth address. So we have the same MAC address randomization as for Bluetooth. The 211 in this example is the MAC address, but there are also various other settings available through this wrapper. Note that you should not switch the ultra wideband communications route out of context, since communication with the one chip will no longer work until restarting the nearby daemon. The always on processor also applies these properties and then also calls a handler in the U1 application processor to get this property set. You might have noticed that both the Apple SPU ROS driver user client and the Apple SPU user client have a perform command method. However, in this case of the Apple SPU user client, these commands are not raw, they are only a few predefined commands. In our case, this exclamation mark just means new service request, and most of these commands also have a few parameters. The always on processor then has a handle for these commands, and it applies these settings and, if needed, also executes a command in the U1 application processor. The easiest option to start interaction with the U1 chip is using AirDrop. 
However, as you can see, as long as the other device is not in the contact list, spatial information is not displayed in the user interface. Note that nonetheless some U1 interaction is triggered, but this is not that helpful for debugging. Instead, you can download the Peekaboo example application from Apple. This is much more helpful and shows distance as well as angle information. In contrast to AirDrop, it exchanges a peer token that is then also used for the STS in the U1 chip. What you can see here is the output of the nearby daemon while the Peekaboo app is running. So what you can see here is that we get regular measurements from the ROST chip and everything is also sent to this sensor fusion to get a solution of the actual values. While the chip is idle, the host sends a regular AP check-in. Once we start the Peekaboo app, it will take a moment and then the uh, iPhones discover each other. And what you can see next is the service request and the ranging start. However, the measurements are not sent via IOKit and this is why we do not see them. If you want to see more IOKit output, you can change my script and reconfigure it to debug IOKit. And with this, you will see way more information. So this was the chip initialization and now we are starting the Peekaboo app. And as you can see here, I will just quit this now. Um, we got a service request with a lot of information. On the left hand side, you can see the most relevant log output from the nearby daemon when using the nearby interactions framework. A new service request is scheduled. And for this, a general ranging packet is built that defines all transmission parameters. On the right hand side, you can see the output of my Frida script. You can see the new service request in detail. Note that the STS blob output format in the original log is not very helpful. Apparently, some developer decided to print each byte in variable length decimal without specifying a separator. When looking at this in hexadecimal, it becomes clear that the STS is composed of contents of the nearby interaction peer tokens. To understand a bit more about the firmware, we need to understand the format and load it into a disassembler. The U1 firmware is contained in every IPSW, OTA image or peripheral image. You can simply extract it from the folder slash firmware slash rows. The FTAP format is rather simple and well known, so there are even existing scripts to extract its contents. As of now, I have encountered five different hardware variants, the iPhone 11 versus 12, the Apple Watch 6, the HomePod Mini and the AirTag. The FTAP that you can download from Apple servers contains an application processor and digital signal processor image. Both of them can be statically analyzed with any reverse engineering tool of your choice. However, the FTAP file stored on an iPhone after an update differs from the original FTAP file. It gets appended by a so-called AP ticket. This is a signature by Apple from the combination of this firmware and your one chip. Each U1 chip has a unique ECID, so you cannot simply boot a different firmware. I have not tried if it is possible to downgrade the firmware of the U1 chip yet, but if it is possible, then only if you have copied the according FTAP file from a jailbroken iPhone that is also signed by Apple. Next, I'm going to overwrite the firmware that I have with an older firmware from a different iPhone with a different iOS version, but also with a different ECID. So first of all, to get the chip into a clean state, I'm resetting it and now I'm going to inject my firmware by pressing enter. And now you should see that the chip is no longer starting. And this is the case multiple times in a row until I'm stopping my script. So I will now stop my script here. 
and you can now see that the chip is booting again. So let's take a closer look into this. So actually we got some errors here. And as you can see, we see that the Rose boot failed and uh, we did not uh, successfully boot the secure ROM. You can also see that we got some crash locks over here. A successful chip boot looks quite differently. So you can see here that we are booting the chip and it is started including some parameters like this ECID. So this is not written, this is just read. So you cannot write this property. I tried this, but um, this is all included in the boot process and also in the signature that is verified. The first thing I managed before understanding all the U1 internals was obtaining logs from the chip. I simply did some static reverse engineering of the nearby daemon, wondering how I could interact with the firmware. I found a handler that always uh, allows to trigger some fatal error handling. The same handler also contains another command to switch off the chip. This can be triggered through the iOS user interface by enabling flight mode. So I simply switched the implementation of switching off the chip and triggering a fatal error. As a result, I got full crash locks. And since this was on iOS 13.3 with a U1 RT kit OS debug build, I also got packet locks. Note that in addition to triggering a fatal error, it is also required to set a few more variables that make the nearby daemon believe it would be an internal build. Once I understood a bit more about the driver structure, I found a better way to call such functions. The Rose controller lib provides a lot of abstracted functionality for the nearby daemon. Since it is a shared library, it even exports symbols. And the lib Rose booter, which is used during the chip startup, also uses the Rose controller lib and also exports symbols. It is possible to directly call the function trigger crash lock in the Rose controller lib. And the second argument is the crash type as an integer. All right, let's actually trigger a crash lock. So for this, let's first of all watch that we are getting a new crash lock. So just check this on the right hand side. And since we are running in Frida, we can also just directly enter a command um, in this interface. So here I'm triggering the crash lock. And now you can already see that the firmware is rebooting. And on the right hand side, we even got a new crash lock. So let's check this out. So the first thing you will notice is that the firmware locks with the packets are zero bytes because this is not a debug build. And depending on the actual crash, we only get an AP lock or also a DSP lock. And we can see the crash reason in the summary. So this is human readable. So as you can see here, this was a codam trigger that we caused on our own. Um, and actually it thinks that the firmware locks are enabled. So uh, I changed everything correctly within iOS, but the chip just does not support this feature. With this, I'm concluding the talk about Apple's new ultra wideband chip. First of all, Bluetooth and ultra wideband are dependent on each other. They use the same MAC address and as of now, ultra wideband only works after initializing via Bluetooth. Apple's own articulate based wireless chips are super, super interesting and also have a lot of security features. The always on processor routing is great for saving energy. And even though we cannot modify the U1 firmware as of now, many features in the chip can be instrumented from user space on jailbroken device. Some scripts that enable you to interact with the U1 chip will be available on GitHub on our group's page. Note that DEFCON will not have a Q&A session this year, so if you have further questions, you can drop us a direct message or write an email. Thanks for watching.